A recent state report found 23% of Iowans live in a child care desert where there is a shortage of licensed providers. As lawmakers consider ways to give the parents of young children more options, we sit down with child care experts on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS, this is the Friday, January 21st edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. For years, policymakers have been talking about a lack of access to quality, affordable child care. It's been called a child care shortage. During the pandemic, they've been calling it a crisis. Our guests here today are here to talk about the child care industry in Iowa. We're joined by Laura Patton, who is the Regional Director of the Iowa Child Care Resource and Referral. Alex Glenn is Director of Human Resources for Generation Next Child Development Centers. Welcome to you both here at the Iowa Press Table. Hi there. Thank and you. joining us remotely is Don Oliver Wyant. She is president and CEO of the Iowa Women's Foundation. Don, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Joining us here to ask questions are Aaron Murphy of the Gazette of Cedar Rapids and Stephen Gruber Miller of the Des Moines Register. So, Laura, I want to start with you. Kay just described this this crisis in Iowa, and let's define the problem for our viewers. What do you see as the biggest issues in child care here in Iowa? Um, well, what we're hearing is parents aren't able to access it where they need to, if, um, just especially in the rural areas. Uh, it's everywhere in Iowa, but rural is really struggling. And then the child care programs are struggling to find staff and the workforce to um, to make up these programs and care for the children. Sure. And Don, why do you think the problem is worse in rural Iowa? We know that it's worse in rural Iowa from the research that we've done. And we're seeing that just because there's not enough staff um, and there's also not enough slots. So when you combine the two, you have a greater issue. Yeah. Alex, are you seeing these problems at your facility? Anything to add to those? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, for instance, have waiting lists for our centers up until January of 2023 at this point. So you know that there are people searching for childcare um, and the staff retention, the, the uh, ability to fill our centers with competent, qualified staff is, is really lacking. And we're seeing that everywhere throughout the five communities we serve. Don, if I could ask a follow-up. Uh, in the spring of last year, there was a state report that said 23% of Iowans live in a child care desert. Um, and it said that 35% of rural Iowans live in a child care center. Has that gotten worse since last spring? We've not actually done the research to see if it's gotten worse, but from the stories that we're hearing and the conversations we're having, it has gotten worse because we know that the waiting lists are growing. We know that the centers have openings, but they can't fill them because they don't have the staff. Um, so we haven't done the actual research, but from what we're hearing, we truly believe it has. So we've identified the problem now. We want to hand each of you a magic wand uh, and ask you how you would fix it. Alex, we'll start with you. From a policy standpoint, what could be done to address these issues that you all just laid out? Um, I know this answer is not going to appease <laughs> uh, a lot of people, but it's money. 
It's a uh, magic wand. It is throwing money at the problem. Um, we need larger centers, especially in those rural communities. Um, we need the ability to house these children um, and care for them and provide educational opportunities. Um, but we also need to find staff for those. I know the Iowa Child Care Challenge has opened up about 9,000 spots uh, or is trying to for child care, but my first thought is who's going to staff those. Um, it's, it's difficult right now. We need, we need help to not only build those child care centers and, and places, but we need, we need benefits that are comparable to other fields, and the money just isn't there to do so. You know, in, in, in elementary education through high school, you have things like IPERS, you have um, great benefit packages, and uh, child care is, we, we provide a finite um, resource. You know, we, we can't provide more uh, spots. We have, we have a, a concrete building where there are walls. We can only care for so many children in there. We can't work harder and produce more to make more money uh, to, um, you know, provide wage increases and, and have people uh, not want to go to other fields and other industries. Uh, so, so, so one of the issues here is also how expensive child care can be for parents. So does this, you, I assume you don't want to raise the cost. Uh, are you saying that the, this financial assistance has to come from the government? I don't know where else it comes from, to be honest with you, um, because child care as it stands is a bubble. Uh, and, you know, just from what we're hearing, and I, I think hopefully people would agree with me on this panel, that it's, it's close to bursting. And I fundamentally believe that the um, economy, all we've heard about the last two years is that the economy has to keep going. We have to keep the economy going. America's a big ship. You can't just, can't just stop it. Um, without child care, the economy collapses. Don, it sounded as if you wanted to weigh in on this. Oh, gosh. I should learn to be, to, that I'm on a mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, absolutely. I uh, agree with Alex. Um, but um, I believe, and we at the Women's Foundation, that this issue is really big. Um, and it's going to take multiple solutions in multiple ways. And those are going to be different from community to community. Um, and we look at a public-private partnership. We need to see both federal and state dollars, but we also need to see business dollars and philanthropic dollars all coming together to address this issue and to really look at what solutions we can put into place to help. Don, if you could give our viewers just a sentence to explain how the Iowa Women's Foundation is connected to this issue. The Iowa Women's Foundation back in 2015 learned of the barriers to economic success for women and girls in the state of Iowa. And child care was identified as the primary barrier that needed to be addressed first um, if we really wanted to see women become economically self-sufficient. And so we started what we call the Building Community Child Care Solutions, which is a program working with community partners all across the state to increase the availability of quality, affordable child care so more women can return to work and become economically self-sufficient. And, and Laura, agree, disagree with any of that, or maybe add something that wasn't mentioned? What, what's in your magic wand? Right. I, I think... Um, I agree with, with what they've both said, and it is, it is that partnership. It's, every community is going to be different as to what the fix will be. Um, you know, as far as you mentioned about raising the rates for families, that really can't happen. So it is how do we infuse some other money in um, so that we can offer the pay and benefits to the employees in child care that they could receive going to work at the public school as an educational associate or... Um, at Hy-Vee or one of the other, you know, large um, companies in, in Iowa. So it, we really do have to figure out how to encourage and invite people to come work in this industry. Alex, you're the HR director of Generation Next. Where are they? How many of them are there? How many people are on your staff? Yeah, so we uh, now serve five communities. Um, our newest location is in Bondurant, um, but we started in Johnston, right down the street from here. Uh, Ankeny, Urbandale, we're actually located in the Farm Bureau building in West Des Moines. Um, we have about 250 employees and looking for more. Um, well, that's my next question. 
how do you find employees? And, and you talked about the benefits that you would like to offer. Can you keep them once you hire them? And that's the issue. And um, we actually did, to answer a, a previous question, we did raise our rates this year. The pandemic's not been easy to navigate uh, financially. Um, and we also want to retain those staff that we've had. And um, it's difficult. We've had a lot of people change fields, change industries. I mean, um, Don might attest to this too, but uh, women, it's a 95% female dominated industry. Women have been experiencing burnout um, in general uh, more than men. Uh, I think the last couple years surveyed, 42% of women are experiencing burnout. So how do we get people to stay? Well, we increase our benefits. We recently uh, brought our childcare prices down for all of our employees to $50 per week, uh, down from half price. We are now offering a 401k. We pay 50% of uh, medical premiums. Uh, we increased our vacation and PTO time for people who have been here for uh, six plus years. And this is all to keep people in the field to keep people with us, people that we love and who are great at what they do, and it's difficult. And once they leave us, they don't go to another childcare center. They leave the field entirely. They go to somewhere where there's less burnout, um, they're not so stressed, um, and where they have better benefits. We need to keep them here. Nobody, nobody goes from Wells Fargo to childcare. So Iowa policymakers are, are looking at trying to tackle this problem with various solutions. One of the solutions being proposed at the Iowa State House right now is increasing the child to staff ratios at some of these centers so that uh, adults could care for more children to help with some of those staffing issues. Don, what do you think of this approach and is, is it the right idea? Well, we, um, the Women's Foundation is a part of a coalition called the Iowa Child Care Coalition which is a group of 11 organizations around the state that advocate for child care. Um, and many of us are looking at these ratios in conjunction with all of the other components that are being brought forward. We wanna see what the big picture is. What we're hearing is this is one step of many that they're gonna take. So at this point, we're waiting to say, okay, if this is one step, what are those other steps? But safety and quality are important, and we need to make sure we don't lose those two things while we look at the other things that we're going to put into place to address the issue. Laura, are people making decisions about where to send their kids for child care based on some of these ratios? Well, we hope that families can, can use some of that as their basis, but right now with the shortage, in some cases, people are just trying to find that slot. So... You know, ideally a family can say, we want to go to a program in our community that offers this, this, and this, but he, he might not have spaces for them or slots for them. So in some cases, they're just choosing what they can find. Um, and that goes back again on the policy piece that in the different, you know, Don's point, like we need to wait and see what the whole picture is in what's being proposed, but keeping quality at the forefront because every kid deserves a good experience from zero to five. So much development happens during that time. Um, we get them ready to send them off to school where they do have to be in a group of 20 or 25 kids and be able to be successful. And so that zero to five age group is when that happens. So that means the childcare needs to be quality. We need adults who are able to work with those kids and be available to them. So you have to take that into consideration when you think about your group size, your class size, and, and those things. And Alex, how are you thinking about that staffing and those ratios to give that quality care at your facilities? Yeah, so ratios exist for a reason, and it's safety. Um, it's a quality education. And if you survey most parents probably in the entire country, you're going to say, you know, whether you're uh, have a whether you have a tenth grader or a kindergartner, what's better, bigger class sizes or smaller class sizes? And they're going to say smaller. And that way, we can individualize education. We can um, provide more individualized care. We can um, get to know the children a little bit better, and we can keep them as safe as possible. Um, I'm telling you right now from what the talks we've had with our management team that if the ratios do get increased, we probably will not participate. Um, 
for one thing, buildings are already made for certain ratios. So our classroom sizes are made for specific things and you, you can't just tack on an extra partition and, and make your building to code. You know, we have our nursery rooms that are able to fit so many cribs, so many toys, so many bodies. And uh, you can't just wave a wand, as you said, and make it so that it, it works. And, and um, at this juncture, I don't think it's something that we could safely implement and, and do. So Alex, I'm stay with you uh, first on this one. Uh, some of the other bills that are being run are kind of uh, similar in this vein and under the larger umbrella of making it uh, easier for a childcare business to either establish itself in the first place or, or grow or build. You know, they've been looking at uh, building codes, regulations, tax credits, for example. Mm -hmm. How much does that kind of stuff help this larger issue? So. I believe that getting child care centers started is huge. The, the child care challenge is, is great, especially, again, as we talk to those rural communities, the ones that don't have access. Uh, that's uh, actually a big reason why we built over in Bondurant, because we saw the need. It's a growing community, lots of new houses being built, young families, so we want to we wanna be there to provide that service. Um, that's all well and good, but we have those other issues that aren't going to be solved by just creating new spots. Tax credits are great, we could definitely use those, but the existing centers need this stuff as well. We need the money, we need the funds, we need uh, a look at, because you know we're struggling as well. It's great that these other communities are having access, but um, this is not just a rural issue, it's not a center of the country issue, this is everywhere. Laura, same question to you. Um. We recite the question. Yeah, just, so so the package. A lot of the bills that are running mm -hmm. uh, right now are focused on, um, you know, building structures, helping childcare centers expand. Maybe how how much of that is the problem, and and how much of it is, uh, to Alex's point, more about just making finding right. ways to right. have some financial assistance to make this thing affordable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I, so, you know, there's been lots of different funding sources out there. And one that Child Care Resource and Referral was helping with was called Investing in Iowa Child Care. And it was for programs starting up, as he mentioned, both child development homes and centers. So people who may choose to run a business out of their home. Um, we also offered some funds for urgent regulatory needs. So if they needed to, to fix something, um, and those things, and then for expansion. But again, as he mentioned, buildings are built so big, and, and then you may want to refit a classroom or something, but then can you find the staff to put in it? So um, it, just there's lots of pieces to it. And it, again, that's why we go back to there's not one right fix for every situation. Um, we really have to look at it individually and, and um, take it from there. Don, what are your thoughts? Absolutely agree. I think this, and we believe that it's going to take all of that and probably things that we haven't even thought about yet. We have to build and expand, um, but we have to then look at operations and how can we continue with operations. Um, our number one recommendation from the governor's child care task force was to increase wages and find a way to get benefits for child care providers. How? I mean, that, that's the big thing, is, is what is that going to take? And I think that's what we're trying to look at, is what are all the different ways we can do that to not only build and expand, but then to support operations so the child care industry can become vibrant and grow and sustainable. Don, you just mentioned the governor's child care task force, which you, which you served on. One of the findings of that task force is that the average family with kids is paying more for childcare than they are for housing. How do you solve that problem of affordability for uh, families? Well, one thing we need to do first is we need to really look at increasing the child care assistance eligibility income. Um, we recommended that that be increased to 185%. Um, I know that their surrounding states um, have a, even higher levels. So first we need to do that. So and Don, quality, is affordable. And Don, if Excuse I might inter interrupt here, you're talking about 185% of the federal poverty federal level, poverty. correct? Correct. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate yeah. that. 
Um, so, you know, first we need to we need to look at that. And then we need to look at what are other ways that we can increase revenue and decrease expenses for our child care centers without increasing parent fees. We cannot put this issue on the back of parents anymore. We have to step out of the box and find unique, different ways to address this. Um, that's why we need to look at public-private partnerships. That's why we need to look at how can businesses get involved. We need to look at maybe a shared services program to help with the expenses um, of child care centers. Just a number of different options. Um, I like to say there will be a menu of solutions and, um, and things that we're gonna need to implement across the state, depending on what is best for each of the particular areas. Sure, so Dawn just mentioned a shared services model where uh, centers could go and get some of those resources taken care of. Can, can Alex, can you describe kind of what that might look like and how you know, centers could use this centralized system uh, to, to sort of meet some of the needs that it's hard to do in a small business on their own? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I do know that when we received some stipends from the government um, during the pandemic, um, that that was really helpful um, in just making ends meet um, during a very uh, uh, difficult financial time as, you know, PPE, things like gloves become more expensive. Um, the food costs are driven up. Honestly? Well and I think Laura is in, involved in, in that sort of policy about the shared services, correct? Yeah, and it's just, it's um, based on the governor's child care task force, it's, it's kind of getting some feet under it right now and, and really looking at how it will go forward. But it is looking at some of those programs to be able to, you know, talk about benefits. Can we figure out a way that we can get some group benefit type things? or? Um, business training. You know, in some cases, um, Alex is part of a very established group of programs, um, but some of those startup programs that people know, like the community needs it, we need to get it started, but they, they don't know how to keep it going. Like um, our service can help them get started and we can be a resource to them, but as far as the day-to-day -day business of running payroll or things like that, they may need help with that. So it really, it's at the beginning stages of looking at this and what it might, what it might end up being, but um, it's definitely a place to start for programs. And even child development homes where you have a, a provider who might be caring for children in their home as a licensed program, a registered program, um, but they could use those resources too. And if I may, um, something like IPERS that, you know, yes. is access in, um, to, our, to our educators. Right. Um, it would be great to be able to extend that into um, our early childhood educators. Something um, like, so that's for retirement. Um, medical benefits are, are really good in the education system and we just don't have access to that. We're constantly haggling every year. Medical inflation is 10%, mm -hmm. which is you know, eight to nine percent more than regular inflation year over year. It's becoming untenable for our employees. I believe one in ten of early childhood educators live below the poverty line. Twenty-five percent of them nationally um, don't take or do take their employer's child, um, medical uh, insurance options, and a lot of them are are either through the Affordable Care Act or on their state their state insurances. We need something like that, like benefits, retirement, medical, to make it an attractive job because nobody's in education to um, make a lot of money. We know that, whether it's a high school teacher or, or an early childhood educator. But there has to be something that you're also getting out of it. You can't just survive in this world on love. Alex, in the couple minutes we have left, uh, mm -hmm. one more thing we wanted to touch on, and you, you mentioned a little bit earlier is the pandemic. Obviously, that was uh, childcare was one of the industries that got hit hardest in, in, in the early stages of that. How, how is the industry doing maybe in general now? And, and, and again, and just in a few seconds here, um, how has it changed permanently in any ways? Um, I think we've had to harden our hearts against uh, <laughs> maybe some angrier parents than we're used to. Um, but you know, it's, it's been difficult. We've stayed open throughout this whole thing, never put anybody on unemployment, uh, never, never shut down our doors unless we shut classrooms during COVID exposures. It's been incredibly difficult. Um, and um, I'm lucky that we're still here 
to be honest with you. I think 50% of child care uh, centers closed uh, throughout the pandemic and uh, you know not all of them opened back up. Um, it's been difficult. We appreciate all the help we got from from the state from the and from the federal government, the PPP. Um, <laughs> we appreciate our staff for sticking with us. Burnout's been insane. It has not been easy. Um, I guess if anything, just say thank your child care provider. We're out here trying. <laughs> Laura, um, you mentioned quality. We have half a minute left. Is there enough of this debate focused on the actual service that's being provided to the child? I think it could get some more attention, definitely. I think we want to come up with solutions, but we have to keep that quality piece in mind, thinking of that zero to five age group and what you're, what you're getting kids ready for. Well, I have to take a um, consideration of the clock and sadly we are out of time for this conversation and we so appreciate you joining us here at the table today. You can watch Iowa Press at our regular broadcast times 730 on Fridays and at noon on Sundays or anytime on iowapbs.org. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.